you know, Fanny, yeah. it's a good day when you get a book dedicated to you. Watch what I do. I gotta spray my hands. Yeah. If you want to spray your hand, you can spray your hands. Smells good. Yeah. Lavender. Okay. Perfect. Again, Dr. Bronner to the rescue. Hi, I'm Sandy Scheller with the Chula Vista Heritage Museum and the South Bay Historical Society. I'm with an amazing, amazing Holocaust survivor, Fanny Krasna Lebowitz. What a pleasure, an enormous pleasure to have you on Our Lives, Our Future. Fanny, how you doing? I'm okay, thank you. Good. I'm doing fine today. Good. I need you to start with, if you don't mind telling me how young you are, where were you born? Tell me what life was like. When I hear where you were, when you were born, then we can bring things up, okay? Yeah. So, um, I was born in Latvia, and the town was called Liba with a German name, but it was changed to Liepaja which is a Latvian name. Uh, it was a beautiful city right on the Baltic Sea oh my gosh. with three beautiful harbors for big ships and beautiful, beautiful white sandy beaches. And it was always such a great joy. Myself and my family my mother and father and my sisters and cousins always to go out there and spend a lot of time in the times when uh, the businesses were closed. Mm -hmm. uh, I am uh, 98 years old, young. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm 98 years young. Uh, I don't really, truly don't feel my age and I'm blessed that I still can remember things and be here to tell the story. You, you walk beautifully. You're able to walk. You're able to see things. You, I mean, honestly, nobody can believe that you're 98 years old. That nobody is, believes it. That is true. I get lots and lots of compliments and uh, I'm flattered to a certain extent, but I still walk and I can still do things and uh, I'm happy about that. And your memory but is absolutely sharp as a tap. You remember <laughs> everything. I'm not so sure, not <laughs> always, but you know the problem are names now, mm -hmm. and that's not really a good sign, but they come back very, very quickly when I forget a name or I can always uh, figure out a few minutes later what I, what I want to remember, so. You're 98 years old, a Holocaust survivor. What do you think are the needs for Holocaust survivors right now? My advice to all the Holocaust survivors is to keep themselves as busy as they can and to do wow. a lot of good things. There are so many people that are hurting, especially now and they can show so much kindness if they still are able to do it. And I think that gives you so much joy and so much good stuff that runs through your body that it uh, actually will make your life longer, I hope. But the underlying thing is, if you have a belief, you have hope. And if you have hope, that is more than anything anybody can ask for because that makes you strong. And I'm going to talk about hope all the time in this interview. If you give up or you are not sure or uh, you are not happy, uh, I mean, not everyone can be happy. That is up to the character. But I think you can try at least to do it. And, when you are happy, you make the others around you happy too. And the main thing, of course, is that I have my family around me, mm -hmm. which is the greatest gift from God. And I can't begin every time I wake up in the morning, I thank God for it. 
for that wonderful gift he's given me. Uh, to me, it all adds up to my old age. That's why it was meant for me to be that old, to tell the story uh -huh. and to love my family. October 27th, 1922. How far back can you remember? I, I can remember the stories my mother told me about me when I was that age. Okay. And even when I was 10 months old, she told me when she was pushing the carriage, uh -huh. um, the doctor that delivered me was very happy to see me always oh. because uh, he looked into the carriage and he used to say, oh, what a lovely little girl. How <laughs> and my mother used to keep on repeating that when I was a little older. Of course, I'm very fortunate that I have a, quite a number of lots of family pictures that were sent by my family mm -hmm. to America uh, to two uncles of mine. And the one uncle left on the birthday of my, uh, on the first birthday, when I was one year old on that day, he left for America. And in those days where I lived, these big ships came in and all the immigrants mm -hmm. went through those uh, immigration houses and it was uh, a lot of people used to come through Libau, through the Libau Harbor. Wow. Yeah, I had a very, very happy childhood. And uh, I mean, I remember back when I was, I suppose, nine years old, eight years old, mm -hmm. when we used to have Shabbat. That's 1930. Yeah. Or now, 1930, yeah. 31? Yes, okay. something like that. And we used to have Shabbat at home, of course. My mother used to come home uh, from, from the business. What was we the business? Had, we had a shoe shop and a small factory behind the shoe shop. She used to come home and she showed the maid because she was a working mother then already. Uh -huh. And we had a Polish young woman uh -huh. that ran, ran during the week at right. home. She used to show her how to make challah and, wow. and bake bulkalach and all that. And then we used to have some guests sometimes. My mom was a very good pianist. So she was sitting at the piano after dinner and playing. And my dad, who was wow. six foot tall, used to say, to me, Fanny, come here, and put me on his feet, and we used to dance. And that I have never forgotten it. See, it I was so impressionable like for me. When did you first become aware of anti-Semitism? I don't think that in my city we had a particular place, like in America, where the Jews congregated, all the Jews lived around the corner of the, of the shul. We had a base, base hamidrash, and the base hamidrash, my grandfather, and that I remember very well, every morning he went to the base hamidrash for doing shachrit. And then in the evening he went there for my as well. And the, the Beis Hamidrash was on the one side of the street and the other side of the street was a big, beautiful Chor Shur. Chor is a, is a choir and that was used only on special days, you know, and Yontef and Shabbat and so. Otherwise we used the Beis Hamidrash. And I was brought up in a traditional Jewish home. I mean, unfortunately, our store and my grandfather's stores that he had uh, were open, had to be open, but we still kept traditional. We had a kosher home 
and that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even though we spoke German in our home, because the town Liebau is very close to the border of Germany, and my mother was born there, and uh, my father was born in a small little town close to Liebau, all where they spoke a lot of German, so we were brought up with German speaking, but we also spoke Yiddish because my mom and my dad uh, insisted that we go to a Jewish school where we learn Yiddish, where we learned to read Yiddish, to spell, wow. and we learned all kinds of other languages, of course, in wow. high school, English and French. We learned Latin if we wanted to stay, uh, um, if we wanted to study medicine or go in the medical field, wow. or you had to even know Latin when you study Euro, yes. which means for to be a to be a. a, a an attorney. Sure. Yeah. You had to you had to study the Roman law yes. and that required Latin. Latin. Uh -huh. So uh, I learned several languages and the skill of my languages helped a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. I would encourage children to learn other languages because you can understand more their culture and how they think and it's a very wonderful communication thing to do if you know the language. What happened? Well, in 1941, in June, the Germans occupied us. Uh, but we were in occupation for a year with the Russians. They occupied us before that. And then the Germans pushed the Russians back and they uh, occupied our city. And the first thing they did was collect, get all the able men uh, on a big square in the city, thousands of them, and they took them to the Jurmala, which means uh, the coast, mm -hmm. they call by the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. right there in our city, and they shot them all. That was the first thing they did. So all the, my father was also one of them. They had an order to all come to a big square and they were supposed to go and work. But that was only, a, you know, an excuse for them to all yeah. gather together in one place. And we never saw him again. You were how old? You are now uh, in 21, 41, like 18 and a half. 18, yeah, so yeah. say like 18, 19. And, mm -hmm. yes, yes. and uh, I must say, you said about anti Semitism. We had a, a lady that came and did our washing. It's not like we have it here with washing machines and whatnot. And this lady, we trusted all our, my mother trusted her all the life. But when this happened, she came to us and said to my mother, give me your fur coat and I will sell it and I'll take some food to your husband because we never saw him again. And that's what some of the Latvians, that's how they extracted all the, the wealth of the Jewish people oh, that had any yeah. wealth at all. And we, of course, never saw them again. And then, in December, they, uh, the SS gave a, 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 an order for us all to stay home because from June, from July, the women that remained back and they kept also back some artisans like electricians and some other artisans uh, that can serve the SS that were in our city. 
the headquarters of the SS, shoemakers, um, carpenters, electricians, uh, all those, those they saved for themselves, the men. And the women they put to work to fix uniforms. So my mother and my sister went to sew the uniforms and- Where? In a building, in a special building? In a in special a building because for the Germans. Okay. And they used to go there with the help. They used to gather there every morning. I did not go because I didn't tell you that I had studied nursing at the time. I, I went to Riga when I was 16 years old. My father took me and I went to university when I was 16 years oh, old. Oh, Fanny. Yeah. Wow. And I wanted to study medicine, but then when the Russians occupied us, I didn't, my parents said I must come home with the Russians occupied. Oh my gosh. Because the Russians weren't kind either. Russians took away the store from my father and the little factory too. And uh, they took it away and they said, you can keep the keys, but the store is not yours. It's an order for you to work there and keep it going. And some of the Russian so soldiers came and they never saw a watch shop or something like that where they came from. Those Russian soldiers, soldiers came from everywhere. Yeah. And they bought, they bought watches and they put them on <laughs> under their uniform, a whole lot of watches. Okay. And they bought nightgowns that we wear our nightgowns, they took them to their girlfriends to have them as not as nightgowns, but to to go out. As, as they were so beautiful no. that they gave it to them as oh, presents. because they were silk yeah. and they were very, very feminine looking. Yeah, very and feminine and looking yeah. and all that, yeah. So uh, that was the Russian stuff. But when then the Germans came in, it was another story. They took our lives. Even the Russians also uh, sent away the very wealthy uh, Jews and other people that had very, and uh, you know, we had, we weren't that wealthy, but we packed up big bags and uh, with clothes and all sorts of things, things ready waiting in case the Russians would send us to Siberia, you see. And some, some Jews from Latvia, from Liba, went to Siberia, but some survived. It was a good thing for them. All the others died. When, when I came back to Liba, I finished my course in nursing. I had started already when the, when the Russians were there at the university and I had a good background already. I finished there and I got a job. I worked for the uh, general hospital. So that's why I didn't go sewing the uniform. Fanny, the big soap opera is named after you, General Hospital with the general nurse. General Hospital. Oh my gosh, you're the original. <laughs> no, I wasn't the original, but I learned a lot actually when I was in the Wow, place. Fanny, what was your favorite part of medicine? What What did you like to do the most? Well, actually, I, I, I when you start, you don't choose it. Sure. Even when you finish, you but don't know. But what did know. you learn to to really, where you said, you know, I really love this. No, medicine. I learned, what I learned, we were three months in, in, uh, in the radiology, three months in pharmacy, My three months Lord. in, uh, it was a different type of education. Did you have a favorite that you liked? I don't remember it really, but there was not a lot of 
one-on-one -on -one with patients. Okay. It was more general Where you were to be able to, to handle everything. Yeah. But patience as well. I see in your eyes yeah. your compassion. Yes. You had great compassion. Well, I wanted to help people yeah. from the time that I can remember. Yeah. That was my calling. And I became a nurse. It did help me maybe survive to not just my leg languages, but that I was privileged to be a nurse in the camps. But that is another story. Okay. Fanny, can you hand me your book I just want to show? I'm with Fanny Krasna Lebowitz, for those of you who know. Fanny's going to continue. I just wanted you to know that Fanny has this amazing book. How does the roller coaster get worse? Well, we were still allowed to stay in our home for the six months. And wow. on the 15th of December came the order that everybody has to stay home. In 1941? In 1941, on the 15th of December. Mm -hmm. Then later in the afternoon, the SS came and of course the Latvians, they had a Latvian brigade that were all anti-Semitic and, and they helped them on top of it if they didn't have enough soldiers, you see. But we all had to stay home and then we had to, um, they brought us to the woman's prison. But my grandfather was with me. My maternal grandfather, the one that lived with us. My other grandparents, that's another story. I, whilst the, the time from July to December, I worked in a hospital that had only eight beds and it was called the Linas Hatzedek. And we had the doctors that weren't killed yet. We had four doctors, two gynecologists. One was Dr. Weinreich, was a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. We had a dentist. And our fourth doctor was Dr. Zick, and he was a surgeon. So we had them, and we had, uh, it was one nurse and some helpers. But that was already when I was in the ghetto. I'm mixing it up every time when I talk about, yeah. So that was at a later stage. But when, I, when we came to the uh, prison, we were all in rows, lined up, and one assessment went through the lines and was one, go here, 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 you know? They knew what they were doing, who is going to be saved and who is going to perish. And so my luck was, he noticed me, I had a red cross band on. I was well dressed, you know. Fanny, you are always everything. beautifully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had boots on and I had a beautiful coat on and, and I had that white band with a red cross and he said, out, you, you go to this side. And I said, I'm not going anywhere unless you let my mother and my two sisters go with me. I don't know where I got the courage and the spunk at my age to say that. And then he said to the other uh, assessment who was below him, let her go and I don't ever want to see you ever again. And I walked out with my mother and my two sisters, not my grandfather and my aunt and two sons that came to live with us when her husband was taken away. So it was just the four of us. My, I had a little sister that was at that time six years old. So it was my mother, myself, and uh, Jenny and Liebele. We walked out and we went home. 
And you went home? Yes, we went home. And then came the ghetto after that. And that's when we established that Linus Hatzedek, which was in existence before in our town for people that couldn't afford a decent hospital or something, for the Jewish people really? that didn't have enough income and so on, and we always had a place for that. But this one now was for the ghetto. Wow. And that's where we took the people that were in the ghetto sick. And while being in the ghetto is another thing, you know. They came and took people to work. They wouldn't let you sit in the ghetto, you know, and do nothing. Mm -hmm. We had one shop that supplied all the food and we could go there maybe once or twice a week. The rest went out to work. So my sister, Jenny, went to chop bricks because the Germans, they demolished a lot of our city. And the Germans wanted to use the bricks again. So they had to chop bricks in the cold, in the winter, and in everything. They had a lot of the ice and everything. The frostbite. Frostbites. But the frostbite said we had to amputate. Amputate a little, you know, finger. a little finger or a little toe. toe. And we didn't have instruments. We had the bare instruments that were possible. And I myself got sick whilst being in that hospital. And I got terrible pain. He was there, Dr. Zick, who was a, actually is a, a, a surgeon. He examined me and he said, get onto the table now. I have to do it now or it's going to burst. Your, Your appendix. appendix is going to burst right now. And he gathered the other three doctors and they ha held my arms and my feet. He operated on it and after nine days I put on my white long things that I had to wear and do the work that we had to do. I had only a local anesthesia. We didn't have any proper anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Only local anesthesia. Only the local. Oh yeah. my gosh. Now I have a nice big cut there on my stomach. He did a very good job. Did he was a wonderful job. surgeon. I knew him from the General Hospital. 1944. Uh, 1944. 1943, on Yom Kippur night, four o'clock in the morning, there was an order the night before to be all ready and take the most essential things I, uh, we can take in a small little bundle. And the ghetto, and we marched out of the ghetto. They took us to the railway line where they had these big kettle cars and they put us in the kettle car. But um, and during the ghetto, there only one person was disappeared because we had a SS commander that was in charge of the ghetto and he had lots of uh, SS people. And they had guards when you went out and you came in, they touched you to see if you didn't bring any weapon that somebody gave you because that was punishable by death. But he overlooked quite a number of them. And he was a good person, actually. You're in a cattle car. Yeah. How many people are in the car? I don't even know how many people there were. But yeah. they meant okay. children, old and young. Standing. Standing. It took us overnight to come to Kaiserwald. The Kaiserwald concentration camp, that was the first concentration camp, and the only one in, uh, in uh, Latvia. It wasn't even 20. 
your your thoughts are what do you remember like what do you mean somebody's taking me to a camp what do you mean i don't have freedom what what are you what are the thoughts fanny there wasn't that we didn't have water in the in the cattle car and we didn't have nothing 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 and how long does the ride take overnight overnight yeah standing it's about 400 kilometers okay. standing next to each other the train just like that like your fingers yeah like that the train stops and then the people it says opens the doors and tells them rouse 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 and you have to get out and then you walk up to the concentration camp eventually or we were i'm not sure did they put us in trucks i'm not sure i can't say i mean i was so upset and uh, i don't want to are you with family fantasize well i was only with my mother my sisters that was that's it those are the only ones that were saved where was the next camp the year 1943 did you stay in for place some about time for some time actually the men they they did the same thing right left right left sure you know and then the men went to a men's camp and the women went to a women's camp but it was the same place and they had koyas there and then they had the recess women and they told us where to go and where to lie down and whatever did you work in a camp yes as a nurse yes not in kaiserwald because i was in kaiserwald not very long you know where i was they told us jenny and me to go and clean an apartment where two felt fables from the army were living and i remember going through a garage and i hurt my knee so i had to lay, eventually i landed up in the in the hospital of kaiserwald we were two nice looking girls sure uh, you still are <laughs> <laughs> no but I, you know they put in a piece of bread in a newspaper newspaper right. and put it in the basket and they did it for several times wow so when i talk to some of my audience especially children i mention it a lot because i think it's very important to know that even though most of the world is evil now <laughs> i shouldn't say it it isn't because there are lots of very good people that help everybody mm -hmm. uh, there were germans at that time that put the, they didn't say anything to us but they put it in newspaper and when we when we cleaned the newspaper basket we took out the bread and we took it home so which when i tell the children that or even some of the adults it it underlines and it tells you that not everyone is evil but unfortunately in germany it took a different kind of a character the second camp was where fanny the second camp they put us on a boat they took us some of the, my sister and me they took us on a boat and they sent us to the reichsbahn i worked for the reichsbahn when i came from kaiserwald right and my sister was shopping bricks again and it was a labor camp uh, in german and there again i worked as a nurse with dr kaspari who was from germany a german jewish doctor wow. uh, and uh, there were 1500 people 
It's called the Casernero. It was, uh, it, you know, they, they had big factories that they uh, employed all the Jews to do a lot of work for the army. Mm -hmm. They needed ammunition, they needed uh, food scents, they needed drinks and scent and cigarettes and coffee. They were always loading these big... Right. Do cars. I even say camp number three? When I came from that rice barn, I went to Staub and first to Stuttgart. And in Stuttgart again, they made us go to Staub. And there's also ammunition factories and all that. But my job was always, I was chosen as a nurse with a doctor. So the one was Dr. Kaspari, and Dr. Kaspari, I don't even know if, he, if they allowed him to be alive or right. not, but he was not the doctor I worked in the following camp that I was in. The last one was, I was in Stolp, in Stutthof twice, and in Stolp once. Stutthof is very close to Danzig. Danzig is a German harbor. You were in five camps. Yeah. Camp number three was? I was in the Riga. Firstly, I was in the ghetto. Ghetto? Then I was in Kaiserwald. Kaiserwald? Then I was in the Reichsbahn. Reichsbahn? Then I was in Stolp from the Reichsbahn to no, not Stolp, Stuttdorf. Stuttdorf. From Stuttdorf, I went to Stolp. Oh and then on the way out, I went again to Stuttdorf. So that's five. I went again to Stuttdorf. And I was in Burgraben too. I, I forgot about Burgraben. I was in Burgraben too. Actually, I always quote that I was in five concentration camps. And you've been in six. I, I, I've been more, <laughs> sure. you know. I want to tell you about yes. the one, the last one that I was in Stolp. Okay. 1945. That's the last one you yeah. were in. Yeah. Talk to me. In Stolp, I had a Polish doctor, a non-Jew, a young doctor with blonde hair and blue eyes very handsome, uh, and then me, and 1,500 people. And then in that thing, we had also a very big officer from the SS that ran that particular Stutthof mm. labor camp. There were 1,500 people, and we were in charge of 1,500 people. Oh my gosh, really? And what my job was to do, most of the time, depending on when he wanted to go out. That big assessment officer that ran that particular camp came and we had to walk through the lines and see uh, amongst the, the koyas who is lying on the koya because either he is he's sick and he can't go out to work. Sure and he wanted to check how many people are left behind. I had to determine if he has got fever, if he can stay or he can't stay. You had to otherwise, decision. they take them away and you never see them again. That doctor, what he did, we, get, we got very little medication. We got some aspirin, we had Tylenol, I don't remember, sure. but we had aspirin, we had a few uh, sinks, uh, uh, creams, salves to put on, and we had a few injections with um, morphine, because we had to have that when we did the amputations. We didn't have many instruments. We had little sores that you, that people used to when they were kids, and they have little sores to cut boards. Right. You know when they make little designs. Tatskes. Yeah, like yeah. an exacto knife. Yeah. Uh huh. That's what we had to use. Wow. But what he did, this gentleman, 
and he wasn't a bad person, but he thought of himself first. Why was a Polish non-Jewish doctor in the concentration camp? He was a nationalist. Yes. He was a Polish nationalist, and the Germans did not want that. Of course. So say he was incarcerated the same Just as like we you. are. Yeah. Only he was privileged because he was non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. They didn't kill him. He took that that stuff that was given to us for he had only several. Every, every week or every second week we got a few. He used to inject himself. I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming, sorry. So Fanny, that's my story. Well I have a, I have to ask you, what's liberation like? When did you realize you were liberated? Were you on a march? Were you in the camp? They and brought then, us, they closed that camp and they brought us back to Stutto and there was the ER. April, oh, May, these April, people. May, June. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Okay. Yeah. No, it was was it in April already? I don't remember. Uh -huh. But um, there was an ER and the people were dying of typhus. Typhus, of course. Yeah. Dysentery, all everything else. They were just lice infestation. Lice, just that's another thing when we came there. <laughs> But oh my God, I, I, I'm telling the whole story of the book. When you finally felt this freedom, this liberation? Not really. They, no, that's right. Why? Because the, and the Germans didn't want to leave any, any uh, footprint. Yes. That's so right. they take us out, took us out from there from uh, Stolp and took us back to Stutthof because Stutthof is close to Danzig and they were going to put all this, and the sick people and the others that they brought on barges, on smaller boats. Right. But especially our barge, when we came and they put us on the barge, they put on a yellow flag on the barge and they let us float on the water because we floated not, they didn't let us, they, they aimed to bring us to Gotland which is a small island in the Baltic Sea, somewhere close to Sweden, but they didn't let us come off the boat. So we floated for nine nights and nine days without water, without food, and that was a hospital barge, all with 600 sick people. Oh, Fanny. 600. And there were several nurses and doctors also in, in that barge, you know? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question I like to ask Holocaust survivors. When did you taste your first piece of chocolate after all this? I would have to lie. Go for it. I don't know. You don't know? When? No. I was very, very ill when we arrived. But we were liberated through a miracle. And I believe in miracles. Of course. When we were there and the people were dying, and we had to wrap them up in the schmutz of blankets, just rags, and let them into the sea. <gasps> okay? When we were still floating, a, a Russian MiG hit our barge and set it on fire. And so the end of the barge was burning, underneath was gasoline, and we were lying on the straws. The people, it was underneath was the gasoline and ammunition, and then there was, was uh, the, uh, what do you call, the stairs were made out of iron in those barges. And the people wanted to 
run away from the fire and get upstairs to the top. We were still floating, but the uh, SS that was accompanying us, they, they were very worried about themselves, what's going to happen to them. So whoever could come upstairs, we had little cotton thing mm -hmm. because we didn't have hair. They cut our hair off completely during all that stuff. Not whilst we were going, but before. And so the ones that had those white little scarves gave it to them and they made it like a flag. And a, a German boat, and, and they tried to, to contain the fire, you know, with pipes and things. So then, then a, a boat that was floating in the sea, looking for German soldier survivors from the U-boats or, you know, noticed us and they came closer and they communicated with the, with the uh, SS and they put planks like that on from the barge on to the other thing. And whoever was able to go over to the other side was saved. And there were 80, 80 people out of 600. This is in the book, correct? Yes. yes. In your wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, people can buy this on Amazon? Yeah. It is absolutely quite a story, Fanny. I could talk with you forever. You are such a beautiful speaker. I know there's so much more as to how you came to the United States that's in the book. Yes. We have to save that for the readers, if that's okay <laughs> with you. Can you do me a favor before we close? Can you give me a message of hope, please? My message of hope is, as I mentioned before, I'm a believer. I believe in something much higher than what we all see on earth here. And that gave me so much hope all through the time that we suffered. And this hope gave me so much strength and so much courage that when I talk about it now, and I talk often over the years I talked quite a lot. I didn't tell you that I didn't speak to my family about my experiences until a few years, very much later when my children were already grown because it's very painful and I didn't want them to go through the pain that I experienced. So I wanted to, you know, to, uh, makes them feel good and uh, but what I'm saying is I have experienced so much hate, destruction, being almost dead which I didn't talk about now after my liberation and through a miracle somehow I was saved too. As that how can you not have hope? How can you not send a message of that to love people, not to hate anyone because their color is different or whatever motivates them to hate us. So if you show love and kindness, it should come back to you. And the message to the young people and the future generations is, that's why we Holocaust survivors keep on telling the story, to make sure that you are going to pass that story on of love and not hate. And I've always made it my legacy. And whenever I talk, I say that Hate is 
never right, but love is never wrong, so you don't have to cut Hate it. is never, never right, right, but, but love, love is, is never, never wrong. wrong. So please, mi dor la dor, remember, never again it should happen to anyone. In my youth, I was brought up as a Zionist and it went with me all through my life. And I worked for the freedom and the reestablishment of the state of Israel when I lived in Sweden and worked for the World Jewish Congress. And I want the young generation not to forget that Israel must be steadfast. It must be, it must be defended with all your might. Remember that, that's very, very, very important message. I love Israel and I'll never forget what Israel has given us. Back our pride and our, our love for what we inherited from the Torah and everything else mm. that's Jewish. Fanny, you owe me something. I do. You owe me a hug when this pandemic is done. I'm going to take this and I'm going to throw it on the balcony and I want to give you the greatest hug okay. I can possibly give you. With that, let's wave to our viewers and say thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Cut. Die Gott hat mir mal zu lieb gewendet, die mir sind kein Ausgegeben, die mir sind kein Ausgegeben.